Hello, everybody. This is C.J. Wiley with more Adventures on the Road. Still in Monroe, Louisiana. Decided to spend another day, and I got some people I'm going to help with their pool games tonight. And uh, at a park that I went to the other day that was so cool, I wanted to come back and experience it again. The tournament, you know, in my life, the greatest advancements I've made is not after winning, it's after losing. It's not after having great experiences, usually it's after having challenging ones, because it always lights a fire under me. It It, it is a the greatest motivator <clears throat> that I've ever had. Like I've told before, the, one of the greatest pool matches I ever had was when... Uh, Francisco Bustamante, I played him in Chicago, and I ran eight racks in a row on him on these tough nine-foot tables. He came back without flinching <laughs> and ran nine on me. Now, I'd never had that happen before. Generally, you put eight racks in a row on somebody. I don't care who they are. They're going to falter, and when that happened, uh, I knew how to put them away, but Francisco was different. So after that match, I uh, went down to Dallas, and and uh, I was training like Rocky, <laughs> you know, and ended up going to California, and uh, and Francisco and I played the match that led to the ESPN match with Earl Strickland, and uh, I ended up winning thirteen to twelve, and and played great, and it was because. Really, because he had beat me before, and uh, I was looking forward to, to the rematch. And it could have went either way still, but but I ended up playing Earl the next day, and he, he beat me Hill Hill. So that really enticed me to, um, to do what I later uh, did as far as ESPN tournaments and uh, got to the finals three years in a row. And, and, and just, you know, like I said, I think, I think that's a... Uh, one of my best traits. I have some bad ones, but that's my best one is, uh, you know, any time that I lose, I, uh, I use it and reframe it and direct it towards something positive. And that's, uh, that's really what happened here. You know, these tournaments are different now than they used to be. Um, back when I was playing, in the 90s, when we went to tournaments, like uh, John McChesney ran the McDermott Tour. <clears throat> and he was really good at it. And uh, every match was uh, timed. I think he timed them 90 minutes apart. And you knew when you were going to play. <clears throat> but even more important, you knew when players were slowing up the tournament. Because it was obvious. Because if, if the matches started getting behind, you could tell... Who was doing it? You can't do that these days. Uh, there's some players that play extremely slow, but nobody really knows about it except their opponent and maybe people watching. But uh, <clears throat> they used to put shot clocks on people if they got to play in uh, really slow. So, uh, you know, in these Calcuttas, uh, you know, the players don't really benefit from the Calcuttas yet they have to wait and get up earlier to be there, which I just don't agree with, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fine with people doing it. I just don't want to do it. And I think this tournament reminded me in a pretty severe way what I want to do with the shooter dare game. Our matches will be scheduled. And, uh, those things that, that, uh, was done that I'm referring to, will be done again where, you know, if, if you play at one thirty in the afternoon, you're going to play at one thirty in the afternoon. And uh, yeah, they get, they get behind a little bit, but, but generally in the, in the shorter races, maybe 15 minutes or something, that's no big deal. And then the next match might catch that up. So, so the tournaments stay pretty much on track, but every tournament now that I go to, I guess the Derby's even worse, where I had a player tell me he had to play a 3 a.m. match and then be back at 9 a.m., and that's kind of what I was heading towards. <clears throat> I don't like getting buys first round. I think the only time I'd want to get a buy is if I, if I was in a three-man tournament. You know, that might be okay. 
But I want to play first round, and I don't care who it is, you know. I, I want to play the best player because I know the players that, that uh, are supposed to beat me have more pressure on them, especially that first round. And, and if I fire at them, I know I can beat any of them, you know, and, and I may have a better chance uh, first round than I do later in the tournament. So this tournament, of course, uh, they told me I really needed to be there at noon because <clears throat> the Calcutta started at 10 a.m. I knew it would be later than that, but I got there at noon and I asked, you know, where they were in the tournament and they said, uh, or in the Calcutta, and they said, uh, eight players. I said, really? They only got eight players left? They said, no, they've only done eight players. Well, there's 146 players in a 128 man board. I mean, they had to extend the board, but it was supposed to be a 128 man tournament. And there again, I'm not criticizing this tournament. Josh Huff and the, everybody involved, Ray and, Hey, they're great, and they did a great job. It's just that I think the uh, the system that they have is flawed, and I'm not going to complain about it. <clears throat> I'm just going to do something that uh, that fixes it, you know. And same thing with uh, the shooter dare, you know, the way the game is designed. It really takes all the luck out of it. So if somebody doesn't win, they have absolutely nobody to blame but themselves. I mean, there's always going to be small roles and and lucky things, but but. It's about as, uh, you know, it, it's just not going to win, especially if you play for a few hours, you know, all those rolls are going to even out because, you know, if somebody misses and hooks you, you don't have to kick at the ball and try to get lucky or, I mean, there's a, there's skill to kicking, but, but, you know, I think anybody will tell you, even Efren, a lot of those kick shots that he made, uh, he was lucky. He says, I got lucky. And, and in that respect, uh, as far as the kicking, I think he has, but consistent luck is a skill. So, you know, it, it all evens out. But my first match ended up being at 7 p.m., so I had to wait there for seven hours. And then, uh, so I won my first match, which was, uh, coincidentally against a guy <clears throat> that I play in the same pool room as and had just seen in, uh, Arlington, Texas at, at Rusty's. <laughs> he and I played first round. So he played, he said he played the best match he's ever played and, and I beat him, but I, I mean, I could have lost that match. I won nine seven, but I played really good when I needed to. <clears throat> and he missed one safety there at the end that, that cost him, cost him that game. So then, uh, you know, I asked when I'm going to play again and they said, uh, it should be about 10. So I got back there at, uh, I just came back at 10 because I figured it'd probably be late. Well, it ended up being midnight. I play that match and man, I just didn't, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. My opponent played great. You know, there again, I'm not taking anything away from my opponent, but I didn't put any pressure on him and I missed some key shots and safeties there at the beginning. And so then my final match was at 3 a.m. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that's probably one of the most miserable matches I've ever played because I didn't want to win. I mean, because if I won, I had to be back there at 11 a.m., which means I had to get up at at least 10 because those 11 a.m. matches are going to start on time because they're the first ones. And by that time, I was just mentally exhausted and physically. Like, I can play for 12 straight hours, but sitting around and, and uh, trying to keep from being bored for 12 hours is, is just something that I'm not good at at all. So anyway, <clears throat> I'm saying all these things not, again, I'm not complaining because, you know, there's a light at, every, light at the end of every tunnel, just hopefully not a train. But what happened was, uh, I actually, to be perfectly honest, after that was over, I was so miserable. I went up and uh, started having some drinks, and then some friends of mine came in, and we started doing some shots, and I really haven't been, like, intoxicated in, in a long time, you know, and, uh, but I did get, and we had a good time, you know, but, but the next day when I woke up, I'd forgot what a hangover felt like. And I mean, since I hadn't drank in a while, you know, at least excessively, I was miserable <laughs> when I woke up. And again, I think that was all because, you know, I, I just didn't feel like doing anything <clears throat> and didn't go back to the tournament because I just didn't feel like being around it. 
but I had a lot of time to uh, do some soul searching. And then a friend of mine from Delaware got a hold of me, and they wanted to do a big shooter dare tournament. <clears throat> and um, it looks like it'll be a big deal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wow. I uh, it probably won't be till July, but but we're talking about doing some uh, qualifying tournaments, and you know the people out there are really interested in the game. I think they see the value of it. So anyway, <clears throat> I'm getting ready to um, to really start focusing on the shooter dare. Now, if you haven't played the game yet. You know, it's going to take you probably five hours to really start to see the value of it. But once you start to to really understand it, it's a different type of mindset. It's the gambling game we all used to play back in the 70s and 80s when gambling was much bigger in the country. I won probably at least a million dollars playing the game. And players like Keith McCready and Buddy Hall and, you know, the old-time players, uh, Wade Crane, Omaha John. David Matlock, they were all experts at that game. <clears throat> and they'll all tell you the same thing I'm telling you. You have to be the best player to win. And, and it, it's very uh, uh, cerebral. You know, there's a lot of thinking involved constantly. And, and that's why it improves all aspects of your game, because you have to be able to learn, especially the three-way shots, when you're shooting at a really hard shot. But... You're also playing shape on the next ball and using another ball to block the pocket. That's why in this game there's no jumping allowed because that takes away from the three-way shots. Because if you hide somebody with a ball and, and, and execute one of those great three-way shots, they just take their little jump cue out and jump over the ball, make it, and act like they really did something. And there is a skill to it. There again, I'm, I'm not you know, skilled everything, you know. Um but it takes away one of the most entertaining, exciting, and strategic shots in the game of pool. You see it a lot in one pocket, but the game is too slow. You can't get it back on TV. This game is scientifically designed. I mean, I put it through a formula, and it took me uh, – I, I looked at the first post I made about it was seven years ago when I made a video, and I never showed it to anybody because I was looking for the right opportunity – and I thought I had it two different times, and, and uh, some things fell through that were just not, you know, under my control at all. So uh, now is the time. You know, pool's getting big, and, and I want to get it back on TV. I did a lot of ESPN events, uh, you know, produced and directed, and I, I did some uh, Fox Southwest uh, or Prime Sports at my pool room. That's where Earl Strickland uh, ran the 11 racks for the million dollars. And yes, he did get paid. We have a documentary about it, and he talks about it. And uh, but I gave him the first fifty thousand, and it took two and a half years to get the rest of the money. So it really messed my life up. You know, I did something that that was, you know, really good. You know, if that million dollar tour went would have kept going, and he hadn't done it the first day, it would have got pretty big, I think. But the game still was flawed, and that's what I set out to fix this time. Is I want the game to show its best components, its best attributes, you know, and, and the shot making and the battle between the two players for the first shot and, and all the the uh, strategic planning and, and understanding the push out, which we call a dare, because you're daring your opponent to shoot. And he can either take the shot or double dare you to shoot it. So there's a there's that suspense of the dare. Nobody can resist a dare. So uh you know, you've got that every game, and so every game has character to it, uh, unlike, you know, when you're breaking the ball, especially with this magic rack and, and uh, you know, wire in the corner ball. A lot of times, the players are breaking and running out, you know, games that really aren't very hard, and, and it just gets monotonous, and new people coming in to watch pool, they'll watch them run like four or five racks, or they're alternating break and running out every time, and they just think, well, this game isn't that difficult. They just run out every time. I got news for them. It is difficult if it's played right. And we used to play the two-shot shootout rules. What I did was refine that game and because uh, it did have some flaws in it, you know, because you could push out and just play safe every time. And I, I hated playing guys like that, you know, especially if they were super talented. 
Like Buddy Hall played the game incredibly good, and he would just squeeze you. Like a shot maker like me, he would just push out to no shot and then just keep ducking until I pushed out something that he could uh, play a three-way shot and and uh, and win. So Buddy was probably certainly one of the best that ever lived. Uh, my, uh, you know, shot-making skills was what made me uh, really good at that game, just like Earl. Earl... But Earl used to jump balls. See, he'd push out and jump over the ball and make it and uh, and run out. So he's the one that really brought the the jump shot to fruition and uh, where everybody started doing it. I heard about him doing it when he was in Texas, and uh, and then I started practicing it, and and I could do it pretty well too. But again, it takes away from the the three way shot. Plus, it's a kind of an unfair advantage if if one guy can jump balls and the other guy can't. I mean, there's you know, there's people that physically can't jump the ball with a full length cue. I mean, you know, they're going to jump better with a with a uh, jump cue. But my point is, uh, just like in snooker, you can't jump balls, and you never will be able to jump balls. They will not allow that because it would uh, it would interfere with the with the character and the uh, you know just the structure of how the game is played. It's snooker. If you could just, if somebody snookered you and you could just get your jump cue out and jump over the ball and hit it, then it's really not snooker anymore. <laughs> you can't snooker somebody that can can hit it every time, you know, by jumping over the other ball. So, so anyway, uh, yesterday, you know, and I I met this uh, this young lady that I hung out with that that uh, she said some things that got me thinking. You never know who might come into your life and make an impression, and 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 she did that. She was real cool and and real wise, beautiful girl. And uh, you know, I used that that chance to you know get a different opinion about things because you know, the worldview of a beautiful girl is a lot different, especially than a male. And uh, you know, they they see things different, and I always appreciate that. I don't want to hang out with people that see things just like me all the time. That would be no fun. <laughs> you know, talk about boring. And uh, there isn't a whole lot of people that see the world like I do. I mean, I do know several hundred that do, and there's millions that do, but then there's billions that don't. And I'm perfectly okay with that, you know. Some things just aren't meant for everybody to see, you know, just like in a magic show. If everybody knew the tricks, nobody would go to the magic show. So a lot of life is about, you know, the mystery of it. Like uh, there's some things that 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 we will probably never know that um, we're told is one way. But upon investigation, you'll find out it's really not. And then when you try to figure out what it really is, a lot of times you can tell that it's just not meant for us to know or understand. And that's okay. You know, the mysteries of life are precious, you know, uh, you know, just like in movies, you know, the, the mystery of the plot. And if you knew what the ending was going to be, you probably wouldn't want to sit through the movie. Same thing with life. So anyway, um, it looks like we're going to do this, uh, this big grand opening of the game on the East Coast. You know, I was, I was going to set things up in Dallas and, and I still probably, uh, there's some people there who's going to do a weekly tournament and, and I may use that as a, uh, as a second headquarters for this game. And, uh, there's a lot of pool players in Texas right now, especially the Dallas Fort Worth area. There's more gambling there than I've seen anywhere in the country. Right now, I mean, they play every single day. And when I went back there, I immediately got action. Uh, and I travel all around the country and, and, and really never really get a chance to play, uh, even, you know, for nominal amounts of money. It's just different now than it used to be. Plus, I don't even want to play that one foul. I mean, it ends up Fetter Gorse said it was 80% the break in the rack when he was talking to Joe Rogan. Well, that's like in golf, the, the drive, the first shot being 80% of the game. See, that would ruin the game. Like in tennis, if the serve was 80% of the game, it would ruin the game. 
you know, uh, that goes for all sports. If, if, if the opening shot is, is that much of a factor, then really you're just seeing 20% of the potential of whatever, whatever sport or game we're, uh, we're talking about. So anyway, uh, I learned a lot this weekend, you know, and I, and I don't think I would have learned near as much if I hadn't had such a, uh, challenging experience. Like I said, I was, by that last match, I just was sick of pool, but not pool. I was just sick of the system of pool, you know, like I said, man, having to stay around 15 hours to play my last match and then have to be back there in like six or seven hours or whatever. Man, that's that's not really pool. That's just an endurance contest. And the most stimulating thing I put in my body is coffee. So you know, I don't <laughs> I don't have the ability to to do things that that help me stay up later or more or whatever. And not that any pool player would ever do that, but <laughs> I think you know what I mean. <clears throat> so. Anyway, <clears throat> I keep saying anyway, I just got a lot on my mind right now. I was just at the Waffle House and had some food, and, and this waitress was really nice, and I was, you know, having a great conversation with her, and she came back and caught me in mid-thought. She said, what are you thinking about? And I said, man, it's complicated. <laughs> she said, really? I said, yeah, you ever play pool? She says, yeah, I love pool. I said, well, that's kind of what I do for a living, and, and I'm getting ready to do something uh that's going to have a pretty big impact on the game at the national and, and probably on the worldwide level. Uh, so I said, I'm, I'm trying to strategically think through some things and I'm getting some propositions that I, that I really have to uh, not only agree to, but I'm trying to give them ideas to make it even better. You know, they want to have a big tournament. And I suggested we do qualifying tournaments, maybe uh, four to eight of them. And I can go in there early, you know, maybe even a couple weeks early and, and give some clinics and, and teach people how to play this game. Because once you figure it out, it's going to enhance all of your games, you know, especially like one pocket, because you're going to shoot those three way shots all the time. And to be a great one pocket player, you've got to be able to hit those three way shots, except in that game, there's there's too much moving where, where you're playing safe and not really doing much other than knocking a ball on your side of the table and not giving your opponent a shot. And, and it's very strategic. And, and I'm not knocking that game at all. I'm just saying I want to get it on TV. If, if, if pool isn't on a major televised platform, then it's never going to reach its full potential. And, um, you know... Matchroom is doing some stuff to get it on TV, but that's more, that's a different thing than what I want to do because they're doing it more like a TV show with, with the uh, glitz and glamour and the smoke and the mirrors and the jumping up and down and lots of emotion. And, but the game itself, really, when you look at it, it, it's really, it's the same stuff. They break and either run out or don't and they hook the other guy and he has to kick it to ball and then they get ball in hand and, or they get lucky or, you know, but it, but the, the, the variables aren't really that many. There's probably like five major variables and shooter there. When you're playing that game, there's just an infinite amount of variables. I mean, no two games are going to be the same. Plus you're going to see things, um, that, that you're not going to see very often in other games. And, and if you do, it's, it's rare, but in shooter dare, you're going to see it, you know, pretty much every game. And you can, you know, according to your skill level, the better you get, the more you're going to enjoy it because you're going to be able to execute those shots. And people that play with me or when I teach them how to play the game, they're going to have to practice certain shots, you know. They're going to have to be able to bank the balls with control. They're going to have to be able to cut balls well. They're going to have to be able to shoot long shots. And then, of course, you're just you're going to have to be able to run the balls in rotation, just like uh, just like nine ball. Shooter Dare has six balls because it's the perfect amount uh, for the Dare to have the most options. If you get too many balls on the table, 
you can't really roll out to where there's like two or three different variables. Like you can bank it in maybe two different pockets and cut it in. Or, you know, you might be able to bank it two rails. But if, if you've got too many balls on the table, it blocks those zones so that they're not an option. So then there's just one variable. And see, that's not very exciting. You want to have at least three most of the time. Then it's interesting because the player has to pick the right variable, and some players will pick different ones according to what they're comfortable doing. You know, some players cut balls better than they bank, or they shoot long shots off the end rail better, or or um, some players are going to be, you know, more uh, strategically minded. So they're going to be able to push out and, like, trick the opponent into maybe shooting shots they shouldn't, or... Uh, Shots that they can make, but it's really hard to get position. I, I do that with uh, players that don't have the knowledge that I have. I'll push out shots that are a little bit off angle. So, I, so if they make it, they won't. They'll barely not be able to get shape on the next ball, and they won't be able to to cover me up with a ball on the table. So, the difference between just an inch of on your rollout can change the dynamic of the shot. So so I could, you know, on every push out, I've got different choices. Depending on who I'm playing and, and their skill level really makes a difference on where I push out. If I'm playing Dennis or Colo, I'm going to freeze him on the rail usually, at least try to, on the push out. If I'm playing somebody that doesn't play his speed, I'll probably an inch off the rail. If I play somebody that, that's less than that, I might push out two inches or three inches off the rail on the same type of shot because uh, Dennis is going to make those shots when the cue ball isn't on the rail pretty much uh, any difficulty level. But when it's froze on the end rail, like playing one pocket, he won't shoot those shots because he knows his percentages go down and what he can do with the cue ball is diminished. So um, so that's where the, the big strategic part comes in. Dan Brooks, man, is watching, it says. Are you watching me? <laughs> Say hello to everybody in Florida, and uh, we'll bring the shooter dare down there, too. Chris Arnold, Tim Hogan. Glad you guys are joining me today, man. I got a lot going on, and, you know, I'm really, it's about time to truly dedicate myself to uh, to this. I've been planning it for seven years, and... Uh, Really, probably eight now. It's the eighth year. A new beginning. That's what eight stands for. Infinity. So, I'm going to go out and uh, get some exercise and some fresh air. This, These trails that I was on, uh, I went out here uh, with the young lady that I was talking about. She'd never really been on a hike like this, so I took her out and... Uh, uh, introduced her to something that I think she really enjoyed. The smells were so good. I mean, honeysuckle or whatever. She, she actually would, took it and, uh, knew how to, like, eat, you know, the juice in the, uh, in the little petals. <laughs> I never, she said, you never seen that? And I was like, no, I don't know if we had those in northern Missouri where I grew up. I know we did because I could smell them, but I, I never really knew that, uh, they had a sweet nectar inside of them. But again, she gave me some some input that I really needed from a perception that was much different than the people I've been hanging around, you know, especially men. Men just don't experience the world like women do. And uh, yeah, that's why it's really good for guys that are in great relationships, because you, you can always cross reference things with your wife or girlfriend. and. Uh, I honestly haven't met a girl that I've been attracted to in a long time. I'm just, uh, I've got, uh, you know, it's just, it's just not, not a thing for me right now. I'm really, really focused on, on, uh, on getting this game up and running and, uh, back to doing some TV events. That's when I had the most fun in life was when I was doing ESPN events a lot. It was it was just a lot of fun. I played one match in front of 2.8 million people, which was the Battle of the Sexes uh, match when I played Vivian Vivarreal. I won the World Open uh, ESPN Championships, and she won the women's, and, and we both played for 
$60,000 for first and $40,000 for second. Now, that's the way it should be. How strong would that be if the finals of every tournament was like 60,000 first, 40,000 second, 30,000 third? We can get there. I think we can get to 100,000 first, 60,000 second, and, you know. That's what I want to pave the way for the younger players that are up and coming. Because if they play shooter dare and master that game, then they're going to play nine ball at a super level and be able to compete and beat these international players. But if they just get good at nine ball and the jumping and the kicking and the, you know, I don't think, I, you know, they, I mean, you see how well we're standing up against these other countries. They're practicing more advanced stuff, you know. I mean, they've got trainers and coaches and it's a lot of times the government subsidizing their expenses and, you know, they got a real unfair advantage. So, again, instead of complaining about that, let's just fix it. Let's just do something better, you know. That's what this country's all about, right? Ingenuity, creativity, a lot of that's been, man, it's, it, it's been changed, you know, where, um, but you know what? We all have our own selves. We don't have to rely on other people and groups to do our thinking for us. We can be independent thinkers and we can, we can think our ways out of just about anything. And like I said, when, situations are the most challenging and when you have something that you consider like bad you never know i was stabbed twice one night almost killed both stab wounds almost killed me but when i healed up i'd always wanted to get in the martial arts well i got in it with a fire under me and uh, i was taking more training than anybody in the dallas fort worth area for a while and uh and I was teaching and uh, I was, I was involved in teaching and, and training for 24 years. Like when I got out of pool for seven years, I was training a lot in the martial arts. So, um, and, and now I'm getting the benefits because I'm in really good shape, but <laughs> I can't imagine I could probably fill a small swimming pool up with the sweat from training in the martial arts. And, uh, I honestly believe if I hadn't have got into that, I never would have reached the level of pool and things that I did in life, you know, without that mental and physical and, and, and emotional training, you know, so that uh, I was more well-rounded and I could work out in my hotel rooms, which is a big um, advantage. Uh, Kenny Wilson, is this game like the old shootout? Uh, well, it has those components, but I refined it and made it made it better. You're going to have to try it to uh, to to see. You, you'll learn it really quick if you know the two shot shootout rules. The only thing different is there's a pocket zone that you have to hit. If you don't hit the pocket zone, they can either shoot where the balls lie, or you get a spot shot with ball in hand behind the line. See, that's another thing they took out of the game, like nobody would miss it. Is the spot shot? I've shot thousands of them. I used to have to practice spot shots to be able to get anywhere on the table. And it's a real important shot, like the free throw in basketball. They took the spot shot out and replaced it with ball in hand anywhere on the table. Well, that's like fouling somebody in basketball and they just get to dunk the ball. That's exactly what it's like. And then rocking your own balls is like pitching to yourself playing baseball. How many home runs would Barry Bonds have hit if he was pitching to himself? Really? Hank Aaron, Babe Ruth, you know, the pitcher's trying to keep them from hitting the ball. Just like when you rock the balls, you're supposed to be trying to keep your opponent from making the corner ball. You can't keep them from making other balls, but you can keep them from making the corner ball. And now what they do is they rack them so they make the corner ball on purpose. Wow. You know, and nobody seemed to notice this except the old school players, you know. I know a lot of them that did. Uh, I mean, Buddy Hall, I've heard him interview. Keith McCready said his game went down the seven ball when they switched the rules from the one foul or from um, the two foul to the to the what they called Texas Express rules. And I know the guys that, that put the Texas Express rules together. But they were promoters and they were running it as a business. <clears throat> they just wanted to get the, the 
the matches over faster and put more luck into it, so they got more participants. I don't blame them for doing that. It's a business decision. But then everybody seemed to just pick it up like it was a better way to play, and it wasn't a better way to play. And I'm going to prove that. And if any living human wants to debate me on the game that I have versus nine ball, they'll stop the debate in the first round because the guy's going to get knocked out because it's not even close. It's like the difference between chess and (laughs) tic-tac-toe. You know, not quite, but close. At least I, I used to say chess and checkers, and then this guy got on me about how his grandpa was a che- uh, uh, what? <laughs> checkers champion, and he told me how advanced the strategies was. In che- I was like, I-, I was just making a joke. I mean, it was just a an analogy. Don't get all caught up in that. And uh, anyway, Kenny says, get the, the wet towel out and dampen the balls. Results is the old slug. Yeah, players used to do that. I know some. I always wondered how they racked balls where they could slug me, and it was with moisture. But, Kenny, I fixed the game. <clears throat> and and what I mean by that is I took everything negative out of the game, and the breaking and the racking has become negative. So the break and rack doesn't matter in this game. It always starts with a dare. It always starts with six balls on the table. And after a champion breaks the balls playing nine ball, there's usually six balls left or seven balls left. I don't even think they should be able to call it nine ball because the game is never played with nine balls. Yeah, they put nine up in the rack, but after they break the balls and the game actually starts, there's hardly ever nine balls on the table. Roberto Gomez uh, broke dry in uh, a tournament I was at, and and he was in the quarterfinals against Feder uh, Gorst. And I told the guy beside me, I said... Uh, I bet that's the first time he's broke dry the whole tournament. Well, coincidentally, they just took a break, and uh, Roberto's coming by us. I said, Roberto, come here a second. He goes, what's up? I'm like, how many times have you broke dry this whole tournament? He said, man, that was the first time I told the guy. I said, I told you. You know, you know, I, uh, I don't know. But anyway... I'm going to keep you guys informed, man. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the head start with this game and I will answer questions on Facebook or, or on my YouTube videos. I, I, I don't look at that as much as I do Facebook. I literally have answered thousands and thousands of questions and, and I don't want any money. I'm trying to help people and I'm giving you a head start to play this game because it's going to make your other games better. If you practice this game, when you go to play your weekly nine ball tournaments, you're going to see things you never saw before. It's going to expand your knowledge base, you know. What I see on a pool table, what Shane Van Boning sees on a pool table, what all the champions see on a pool table is different, you know. And I've, you know, I've been teaching the last few years the, the physical fundamentals and showing you what they're actually doing from the ground up. I can tell a champion player by watching his feet. I watch the feet, the hands, and what they do. The feet, the hands, and what they do. And I can tell how good somebody plays in a very short amount of time. And it's very hard to to disguise that. I can, but I don't do that anymore. You know, when I say disguise, I mean like stall where you make people, uh, you know, believe that you don't play as well as you actually do. There's an art form to that. But my hustling days are over. And... uh, I don't ever want to go back to that. But this is something that's going to benefit everybody, especially the younger players. I always think back when I was uh, nine years old and I ran my first rack and how much I just loved the game of pool. And it took me all around the world and, and it gave me a life that I could never have had without that game. And there's a lot of people that I've talked to that will literally say pool saved their life. When they were going through times that were really bad and, uh, you know, they were depressed or, or whatever. And, and pool was their, their getaway and it got them away from drugs and it got them away from bad things. You always hear about the bad elements of pool, but nobody ever talks about the good parts. Pool has literally saved lives of friends that I know. 
there's one female player especially that has told me that several times that uh, that she probably wouldn't even be alive if it wasn't for pool because she was in a real bad spot in her life at one time and uh, she got away from it just by playing pool all the time and now she's very well known you see her on Facebook all the time I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to mention her name right now but uh, she has told her story but I think I probably got maybe uh, a few more details <laughs> Rob Saez. Yeah, brother, yeah. You'd love it. You're going to love it. You know? And, um, you know, you know. I, I think the, the push out was a little bit before your time, Rob, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Because when it changed, it was weird. It was like somehow it was just like eliminated out of people's minds. Uh, but I know, I know all of you have heard about it. I've, I've listened to some interviews, like with Buddy Hall. He has a real good interview about it on uh, YouTube. Uh, you could probably search it and find it. <clears throat> we did and listen to it. And Buddy's saying the same thing I am. He's just, he's, you know, how much more strategic the game was. And uh, like I said, Buddy Hall was a monster to beat playing that game. I would love to have seen Buddy play an Efren that game. See, the Filipino players like Efren and, and Bustamante and those guys would not play me that game. I tried to play them those rules, and they would not play those rules and because uh, it would have been a different deal. Like like Efren, I'm pretty sure, would have had a disadvantage against me. Now, Bustamante, I think, is a little stronger shot maker. You know, I, I, Bustamante is probably the best nine ball player that I've ever played, you know, back when we were racking for each other and everything. This, I don't think he likes this rack for yourself alternating breaks any more than I do. He just doesn't say anything about it. But uh, like I said, I ran eight racks on him and he ran nine. Now, if we were playing alternate breaks and racking your own, I mean, and even if I ran eight and he ran nine alternating, it still wouldn't have been that big a deal, you know, a lot of people, because you're just seeing somebody run one at a time. And, uh, you know, who wants to watch that? When I came back from playing, or when I came back from, from taking seven years off, the first tournament I went to, they said, CJ, you're on the TV table. I was like, TV? You got TV here? And they're like, oh, no, it's better. It's streaming video. I'm like, well, if it's better, why don't you call it the streaming video table? <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> they didn't even like that question. But that is my question. Okay, if something's better, why would you call it the other name? You know, if Coke's better, why would you call it Pepsi? You know, if Chevy's better, why would you call it Ford? I mean, it wouldn't make any sense in any other scenario. So, um, but, uh, yeah, when I came back to the game, it had changed a lot. Like I said, they, they weren't scheduling matches. So it's just a shotgun start all the time. I don't get that. Why could we do it so well? in the 80s and 90s, and the tournaments are pretty much always on schedule, just as much as they are now. So why, with our computer technology and everything, can't they schedule the tournament where you know when you're going to play? And you then you get a text, and it, and it tells you maybe if it's going to be a little late. I mean, you could automate all that stuff. And then if you've got one player holding up the whole tournament, which does happen and, and happened, it's happening. I will assure you that. There's some of these top players that play like... Uh, Good grief, man. It's like they look at every single option that they're not going to do before they look at the one they're going to do. And then they take 15 shots uh, or get up and down and up and down. I mean, I can't stand that. I know Rob Saez can't stand that, right, buddy? <laughs> but it works, unfortunately. But in the tournaments we do, that's not going to be an option. If it says you play at 2 o'clock, you're going to play at 2 o'clock. And if they're 15 minutes late, that's going to go into our system. We might do it to where we, we uh, you know, have a running total of how long it takes every single player to, sh to play a match and post that publicly so you can see the average of how long each player takes to play a match. And then the ones that shoot up there to be the slowest, 
man, we'll put a shot clock on them from the very beginning if we have to. We'll definitely tell them. I mean, I will assure you, uh, you have to have rules. You have to have a protocol. Or you can't blame them for doing stuff like that. You know, if it's not against the rules, it's just like when they're when they're wiring balls to make the corner ball. There's no rule against that. So, you know, but how are you going to make one to solve that problem? That's how come I just took the breaking and racking out of shooter there. Um, I wanted to take everything out of the game that caused controversy or anxiety. And you'd be surprised how much anxiety there is breaking and racking and kicking and jumping and and the rolls when the guy misses and keeps hooking you. Oh, my goodness, man. Uh, you know, I'm surprised there isn't more big upsets with these top players by guys just getting lucky. And every time they miss, they hook the guy in a way that he can't even hardly kick at the ball. It doesn't seem to happen that much, but I know it does happen. But... Um, Chad Brewer, yeah, take longer on key shots, that's fine. What I'm talking about is somebody that looks at all three options on every single shot, and I already know which one they're going to shoot. So they're doing it intentionally, you know. They don't have to look at every single option every single time. Uh, but you can't stop them unless there's a rule against it, and you have to have a shot clock. You have to have something all sports have rules except pool for stuff like that. There's a shot clock in basketball. There's there's in 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 all sports. I think uh, there's some kind of there's some kind of clock. You know, tennis. I'm not sure about tennis. You know, they're talking about slow play in golf now, and some of these older players are coming out and 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 taking a stand against slow playing in golf because they know that. You don't have to take that much time to play, you know. And again, if you've got a key shot and you need to take a little bit more time on that shot, hey, that's cool. That averages out. But if you're doing it on every shot, that's when you start slowing up tournaments. And uh, a match that should take an hour and 15 minutes takes two hours and 15 minutes. Or, man, I've seen matches race to 11 take like four hours with two slow players. I've seen that a few times. I don't know what the record is. I think there there was one that might have been, I don't know. I think four hours, four and a half hours is probably about the most I've ever seen with two notoriously slow players, and they were playing each other. And I went down to Hill Hill, and my God, it's like watching paint dry or grass grow, you know, trying to, you know. And I, I think that's a disservice to the game because if somebody has never seen it before, or just, you know, they know about pool, but they never seen pros play, and they go watch one of those matches, they may never want to get involved with the game. I wouldn't. I won't watch those matches. I can't watch a nine ball match more than just a few minutes because I just watch to see who's breaking the best. And that's basically, <laughs> that's basically all I watch for. You know, I know they're going to run out every time, especially on a bar table. Uh, and the big tables with, you know, they're easier actually with the fast cloth. I mean, one of the older time players was, was talking about that at this tournament. You know, we play on pretty slow cloth. So if you got like straight in close to the end rail and you had to draw the ball back and spin it back down to the other end rail, you had to have a massive stroke. <laughs> like you had to hit that ball and a lot of guys couldn't. They didn't have the strength or power in their, in their stroke to, uh, to be able to do that. But that's the penalty for getting straight in on the shot. You're supposed to be uh, penalized for making bad shots and rewarded for making good shots. Like I said, scientifically, I created a formula to do that in the shooter dare. And, and you'll notice when you start playing it that you're always going to be rewarded for making a good shot and you're going to be punished for making a bad shot. And the rolls aren't going to matter that much because if somebody misses a shot and hooks you by luck, then you just push out and dare him to shoot one. He's still going to have to earn the game. He can't just hook you and you miss the kick and he gets ball in hand and, and waltzes up there like he really did something. And, and he just really lucked out on you. That 
I can't stand that. And I know I'm not alone. <laughs> I know I'm not alone. You know, I hear, you know, the top players uh, talk to me about this stuff and they, you know, they're not real vocal in public and, and, you know, nobody wants to hear people complain and I am not complaining. Like I said, I'm solution oriented. So, so I've planned this for a long time to, uh, to really fix it. You know, a lot of people have had ideas and, and there's been games like bonus ball, but if you put bonus ball into the formula that I did for shooter dare, I mean, it would, it would score like a two on a rating one to 10 shooter dare is at least a nine. I mean, we may refine it. We may polish it up just a little bit to make it a 10, but it, it's going to be, you know, about a nine and a half. I don't think anything's perfect, but, uh, my goal is to make it as perfect as possible. And there again, what that means in pool is you have to be able to make a good shot to win the game. You can't just duck and play safe and force the guy to kick and miss and, and, and give yourself ball in hand. It's not going to work. There's no ball in hand in this game. The best you're going to do is a spot shot with ball in hand behind the line, which still takes – anybody can miss a spot shot. I don't care how good they are, especially on tighter tables. Uh, uh, under a lot of pressure, it's like a free throw. You know, those guys that can make 98 out of 100 free throws – for fun, they can miss one in a key situation because of the pressure, but they're not going to miss a dunk when they're not guarded, just like people aren't going to miss a ball with ball in hand when they're not guarded. There's there's no defense uh, on them, so that is a fact. So anyway, you know the game is the teacher. Now we're going to start to play the game. So anyway, I'll keep you informed, and I got a lot of cool stuff on the table that I'm trying to work through, and uh, that's what I want to do in life. This is my goal and destiny, and I'm going to do my best. I appreciate your uh, your support and help, too. I mean, I need everybody that really wants to see the game get better to at least give it a try. Hey, if you don't like it, wait and try it again another time. If I teach you the intricacies of this game and you like pool you're going to love shooter dare so if you want more information go to shooterdare.com shoot or dare it's like truth or dare but on a pool table